Uh, she previously she worked at 3i and uh, Vodafone and back in India at E Ventures. Then we have was that all correct? Ten out of ten? Uh, roughly. We'll, we'll take roughly, right? What was the other? Didn't work in India. But. Didn't work in India. E Ventures. In the U.S. In the U.S. That's quite close, isn't it? Um, ten thousand miles or something. Omar, let's see if I can get a ten out of ten on this one. Um, Omar is an Imperial alum. Um, he, after leaving here, he went to, uh, he set up his own company, which is Western Labs. He was a developer there. Uh, he got into mobile uh, very early on. He's a mobile guru, um, working at Swift Cover and then AXA Insurance. Recently, I, this year, only a few months ago, he launched Blippar. And I've got some good news for you. Um, he won last week, last, how long ago? Wednesday. Last Wednesday, uh, the UKTI first place award uh, to Omar, which means basically he gets to represent uh, the UK over in Las Vegas. And I've seen the film Hangover, so I don't know how much work's going to get done. <laughs> but, but Omar, congratulations, that is fantastic news. So a great lineup, let's start. First of all, if we can, um, a general question to you all. Uh, Steve Jobs uh, died this year on October the 6th. Before we go into the nitty gritty details, I just want to hear one, one minute from each of you. Martin, I think you met Steve Jobs back in 2007. One minute from each of you on what you think his legacy is. What lesson, one key lesson, can we learn from Steve Jobs' success? Love chucking people in the deep end. Let's start with the person who met him, Martin. Well, I, I, um, I actually, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint everyone, but I have a very difficult meeting with Steve Jobs. Uh, we fought for 90 minutes, basically, <laughs> which was very disappointing because I had Google, Skype, and many other companies as my partners in phone, and we had a very rough meeting. Now, I, two days ago, I found out why. Two days ago, Wire disclosed that what happened is, because when I met Steve Jobs, the first thing he said to me is, oh, I like phone. We're going to do phone without you. Right? That was the, the opening line. Right? <laughs> He was worse than me, at least as your, job, as your boss, right? And it was terrible because I thought I was beating Buddha, okay? Uh, but now, two days ago, it came out that he wanted to do phone, and they said, they said that he very much wanted to do something like phone. It was out in Wired, and that it explains a lot of, well, first, him wanting me to, to meet me, but also his intense interrogation and, and interest in phone, which led to a very difficult uh, encounter. Having said that, clear the genius of our generation in terms of product design, and we all love his products. Um, well, I've never met Steve Jobs, so I don't know how much I can say. Uh, just from reading um, articles and stories, I guess the one thing that I can take away from him is the attention to detail to all the products that he's done, and that they wouldn't sell, settle for something which is less than perfect. Good. So perfectionist. I, I mean, I, I guess I have a contrarian view to this. Uh, I, I don't need that to be. Um, <laughs> I think you have to decide what kind of a human being you want to be. And I think, you know, uh, he wasn't exactly the greatest human being. There's some parts about what he did you can really take you know, take into what you do around sort of being obsessive about detail and wanting quality, being obsessive about quality. But I think being an entrepreneur isn't the only thing you are. You're a human being at the end of the day. So I think there's a lot of qualities that weren't so great. So you have to look at the overall picture. And a quality you thought was great about him? I mean, it is, it's an incredible obsession over quality yeah. and being, you know, believing that everything else kind of sucks and, you, you, yeah. you know, you're placed on this earth to kind of do something, do something better. And that's brilliant. Hopefully you can do it as a good human being, too. Yeah. I'd be quite flattered if you wanted to take my idea. It means I'm on something. <laughs> That's done. Uh, nothing more really to add apart from perhaps alternative therapies don't work when treating cancer. <laughs> it's a controversial one. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's, it was been said, right? I agree with everything that people no, have said no, here. Obsessive, yeah. product detail, and products that you know change your life. Great. And if my two-year-old can use uh, an iPad, I think that yeah. shows that he's got the interface, right? Yeah, <laughs> making technology simple. Um, okay, straight into, uh, as Alison mentioned about the idea, the five things we need to get right to get a great business off the ground. The idea, let's explore that first of all. 
Um, I want to ask the panel, uh, there's some of us in the room that want to be lifestyle entrepreneurs and that's earn a little bit of money. There's some of us in the room that want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg or the Biz Stone from Twitter. So for the latter group, I'm going to ask this question to the floor. What are the attributes of an idea that could become a billion dollar business? And I'm going to ask that to the guy that's created two of them, uh, Martin. Well, I think there's two ways to get there, but I, I'll give you an analogy with literature. You can write an amazing biography of Napoleon, or you can write an even better story about the life of a doorman. <laughs> what was the story about the life of the doorman? <laughs> no, like, have you seen Downtown Abbey? Okay, I was watching Downtown Abbey and I said, why am I watching this? Yes. Like, this whole thing is about whether these people are going to keep this stupid house, but there's something about the way that the story is told and all the, it, it got me, it got me. So they didn't need to make a World War II documentary, right? They made a story of some people, whether they could keep a house or not. Um, and I watched all the episodes. So, I, so to answer your question with, with, without an analogy, is amazing idea uh, with reasonable execution or amazing execution of a banal idea. Yeah. And, and the great people, you, you manage to do both at the same time. Yeah. You come up with a great, a great execution on a great idea at a great time. OK, so making sure the timing is, is, is right. Um, yeah, because Nicholas Zenstrom, uh, who obviously founded Skype, to go to your point uh, there, Martin, about hating something. Uh, at Zeitgeist, he said, what's been working for me is I see things every day that can be done better. It's about focusing on the very simple, basic value propositions, um, because very simple propositions to a lot of consumers have a big impact. For example, enabling people to talk anywhere on the phone around the world with great quality for free, not having to pay the phone bills, is an idea that could service billions. Uh, he sold his company for 4.1 billion, which isn't enough to live on, but it's a pretty good start, I think. Great. <laughs> he sold it again. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. He sold it again, exactly. Um, so how do we know, though, if something that annoys us, that we want to improve, is actually a money-making idea? Because there's lots of ideas out there, there's lots of things that annoy us, but how do we know it's actually gonna scale into a business that could be very uh, lucrative? I mean, I think if you're, if you're you know, if it's, sim if it's simple but powerful, you'll figure out a way to get people to pay for it at, at some point, I think. But the, you know, the devil is in whatever your vision is, I think taking your last question back to kind of tangible reality for a lot of the people in here. You know, you, you might have a very sort of big vision or a big idea. You're probably gonna start with a focus or, you know, and it's thinking about kind of the, the gem in that is, can that grow bigger? You know, can every single person in the world potentially be, you know, benefit from it, use it, and how, you know, how big can that really grow, right? And you don't need a lot of mathematical models or you really need to kind of dig into that dig into that idea and see if it can really grow. And again, convincing the people around you that, that that's even possible. So. Yeah, yeah. Anybody like to elaborate on that? No, I think it's different between uh, for B2B businesses and B2C businesses. B2C businesses, you have to see like your mom using it or your family using it every day. But B2B businesses, I guess some company like Autonomy, which deals purely in B2B, they uh, just got sold for six billion or yeah. Seven billion, and uh, they just do statistical analysis for companies because they make products. Yeah. Okay. So making sure the right timing is there, making sure that you can. Can we talk about um, creating a proof of concept? How important is that? If we've got ideas in the room, is the first step for us to go and try and find VCs, or is it to try actually try the product or service out on a small scale? Uh, so speaking from my um, experience. Um, you've got to build something to show people. Um, so we we built um, we had Huddle a full app working. It wasn't really. It was like an Excel spreadsheet that you could click through. It was completely faked HTML, but it was enough to convince customers and investors um, to get something built. So you've got to got to get something because if it's not in your head, um, 
if it's just in your head, how are you ever going to you know, get it built? Now, if you've built businesses before, you've got advantage of some money. If you haven't got that advantage, you know, you're starting out, then you need to find people who will help you build this thing, whatever it is, a product, a service, an idea. Get something out there that you can visualize and, and learn from and get people excited about. Um, and the really best people in the world figure out a very simple way of doing that, um, a simple way to get your idea off the ground, which is Ashwin's point. No, and I just I wanted, I wanted to say that you're, in that sense, a lucky generation because it's gotten so much cheaper yeah. and easier to build prototypes than it used to be. I mean, all the tools are there. You come to one of the best universities for getting coding resources and getting, if you don't know how to do it, getting somebody else to help you. That didn't used to be so easy. Um, the amount of capital that I have had to raise for my companies as I progress in my business career has been for companies, let's say uh, uh, the companies that I build, and when I think of their value, um, less invested for more value as time goes by. Uh, in the sense of phone now, phone is like a telecom company. Well, I built many other telecom companies, uh, Viatel, Jastel, Yadotcom. We investment, tremendous investment in CapEx, and then in phone is like a, the CapEx, we get paid for the CapEx. It's people buy a phone router and they build phone. It's like a user-generated network with positive CapEx. So I, we, we, we get smarter at raising less money and getting more value because the tools and the technology, we basically started hacking routers. That's what we did. We hacked routers. We changed the firmware on routers. We changed the behavior of routers to send out two SSIDs instead of one. We, we started writing code for, for routers, right? And actually, there was an, an open source system called OpenWRT that we used and we modified. And so there's, there is, you're lucky in that sense. Yeah. Omar, um, you've uh, just launched a business that's, that's only a few months old, and you've already raised how much money? Um, currently we're raising $11 million. Okay, so yeah. we've got a real life uh, example here. Omar, did you build a prototype proof of concept in order to raise that money? Yeah, of course. I mean, we started off uh, building a, uh, we had a simple prototype first, and we needed to raise £50,000 to get off the ground. To uh, And the investor said, oh, I was going to take two, three months to get that money to you, because oh, that's too long. So we carried on development, then we needed 200000 and half a million. Then we were... Uh, making revenue, so then we needed a few million to expand to other territories. Then we were a profit-making company within the first few months, and uh, you know our profit margin, because we're selling a software service, our profit margins are somewhere between 80 and 90 percent, and uh, we'd be making uh, I don't know, over nearly a million, half, over half, between half a million and a million revenue by the end of this year. So that's why uh, we're raising that money. So we've delayed the investment bit by bit until we can raise more and more money. Thank you. Uh, so I saw Reshma nodding her head there about software and big fat margins. Um, Reshma, if you'd like to pick up on that point around funding as well and proof of concepts. You, Reshma, invests in, in companies all the time. So, Reshma. Um, yeah, I mean, we, it's incredible kind of the spectrum we're, we're seeing. Uh, we, we certainly see startups that, you know, just have kind of a prototype. It's not even necessarily in, in English, but others who have, you know, a few K in revenue on a monthly basis. Simil again, similar businesses, just uh, w you know, it's just a stage thing of, about how, how far they've gotten, you know, they've gotten on bootstrapping. But you know, these guys are basically profitable with being two or three guys selling selling software, um, software as a service to you know small businesses or individuals, um, doing some you know doing some decent revenue on a monthly basis and just looking for that connections, the network, the kind of that extra capital to really take it to an, another level. So again, compared to five years ago, 10 years ago, you know, you guys can, s the group of people in here can together build a business that makes revenue, you know, pretty, pretty soon and you don't need capital. Mm. I, I had one thing, which is every business, very successful business has, it's a frequently used term, but like a special source, like a secret weapon that makes them very, very successful and can grow at an exponential rate. Like Martin's with Hacking Routers, with us with Huddle, it's the viral nature of it, right? Saying enterprise software virally. And if you've got, if you figure that out, that's the bit that takes time early on. Yeah. If you spend your time figuring that out, that works at low scale, like your business, 
our business in this scenario. They work at low scale as it does at maximum scale. You shouldn't have to raise billions of dollars to get it to work. So if you can figure out that special source, as soon as you press the go button, that should start working for you. There's obviously some capital to get it going. But yeah. if you, and that's what, that's what you know you've got something really going, because things start to happen. And yes, in B2C, it can be very instantaneous and a fast growth. B2B, sometimes can be a bit longer, but you should still see that happening. That's, I mean, that's such a great point, and that'll convince your partners, potential investors, anybody to you know put money into you or work with you or join your team if you can really you know work on that and figure that kind of secret sauce out. I was listening to Michael Birch, the founder of Bebo, as you know, who sold his company for 850 million speak, and he was saying that a lot of entrepreneurs they have this idea and then they go and try and raise capital straight away. They do six or twelve months trying to raise capital when it. It can be futile. Get the concept working first, and then go and raise capital when you've got that working. Um, okay, if we can, uh, because I'm conscious of time, if we give another 10 minutes, and we're going to open it up to the floor because I know there'll be lots of questions. Um, let's talk about a, a, a one that's uh, that's been touched on before. But when should you start a business? Stelios thinks you shouldn't start a business when you're three, uh, unlike some of the other people's beliefs out there that he thinks you should do an MBA two or three years in a commercial environment and then start. Um, thoughts from anybody who feels passionate about that subject on the panel? Well, I already said that, yeah. that some people can't do that. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I, um, I, I, I did two out of uni and still the first two were my best ever ideas. So like if I'd executed on them and actually had the balls to get on with it, I would have made it very successful. The time I spent being very successful in the company environment were the three miserablest years of my life. So I think, yeah, get on and do it now. Why not? I think for me it's been um, spotting the right opportunity at the right time and being around the right people when that opportunity comes along to be able to execute it properly. Okay, so mixed messages. I think it's just, you just keep going until you get it right. So you yeah, try one, right. right? You might not get the idea right, but you might make enough money just to live off. You might not find the right people. Yep. And yep. then the second, but by doing the first one, you meet the people who are then going to be helping you on the second one. And then you figure out the things you didn't do the second one and you do the third. I mean, definitely, yeah, it's all a great experience. And by surrounding yourself with people and getting out there, you keep doing it. And also, I mean, setting up a business isn't, you know, you don't, you don't need sort of 10,000 square feet off the space. And I mean, you just kind of start something on the side while, while you're at school or in, in the summer or during, you know, during Christmas break instead of eating too much, um, work, on, work on an idea or something. So, and as that grows, and you'll see which one's growing, whether your academics are growing or whether, you're, uh, whether your business is growing and you start to spend more time on it. So I think it's, okay. you know. So very also, it depends on, I think, what is it exactly that you do when you say work experience? Mm -hmm. Like, if, when I also invest, right? I invest, and I invest maybe in a, a company every quarter or something like that for a year. I only invest in companies whose products I use, and I only invest in companies that I mentor. So I, there's a lot of companies that make great things that are just not part of my life, and I don't invest with them. So it's not a very objective way of investing, but it works for me. Now let's say I have somebody who says, oh, uh, I've been working for 15 years and now I'm ready to be an entrepreneur and I'm going to start a company. Or I have somebody that has tried and failed three times and he says, and comes with ideas. So you can say, well, what, just all, all else being equal, who do I prefer? And all else being equal, I prefer the, the person who tried and failed three times than the person who said, I've been getting 15 years of job experience, now I'm ready to start my company. Because it may be uh, uh, 15 years of your brain cells dying. <laughs> so it's, I can see the people who try and fail. I don't see them as, as people who, who, who are somehow you know, getting, getting older. So, so I think it is important what does the work experience mean. Right. I think in everything there's advice that's very contradictory. I think at the end of the day, it's got to be, does it feel right for you, as Omar just said? Does it feel right? Do you have the idea? Do you have the people around you? Does it just, does it just uh, go? OK, um, if we can talk about pitching. OK, so we've decided to go with the idea. You've got the idea. You've got a proof of concept. Uh, you want to go and pitch the idea. So Reshma, who sees lots of pitches, and also Martin, who invests. And that's one of them trying to pitch now. Um, do you take telephone pictures? You know, do it live. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, 
Gresman, what's, what's one or two of the things you see as common mistakes when people come in and pitch? And what are one of the two of the things that sort of excite you when you see it, thinking, that's the place I want to invest my money? Um, I mean, I think it, it's easy to spot the disasters, right? So when, when the pitch is just all over the place and um, it, it, it's just not making sense and you can tell in the entrepreneur's eyes, it's not making sense either. So I think, you know, that that that's sort of uh, that's sort of easy. I mean, if you can't tell your story in a minute or three minutes or, or, or five minutes and get the other, you know, get the other person excited, I mean, those are sort of, tr you know, tr again, try it on this audience, right? Try it on, try it on yourself, try it on your friends, your family. Is it does it convince anybody to, to kind of take you seriously? So I think that's sort of the mistakes we see around pitching, not practicing enough, not, you know, not sharing your idea enough. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, it's the, it's, the, it's the people that grab you in sort of the first minute or the first sort of half, half a minute and it, they just get you onto that next part of the journey where you want to listen to them for two more minutes and you want to listen to them for another half hour and, you, you, and then if you're in a meeting, you know, getting into sort of getting into a real discussion about it, getting, getting into the kind of nitty gritty, then you know you've got the people people hooked and so I, I think you just have to keep practicing and, and listen to you know oh, be open listen to what your audience is telling you if they don't understand something that's your fault you know you aren't explaining something um, well enough to them so so it's kind of it's pretty easy to tell the good from the bad and you'll be able to tell um, if, if when you pitch, you know, people continue to want to talk to you or they're going to talk to someone else. <laughs> is, it, is, it, is there a tendency sometimes to uh, see a presenter that doesn't present well, but there's a genius idea behind it? So can they get missed easily? And if that is the case, would you always uh, prefer or suggest a good presenter presents on behalf of the company? Or? I, I actually don't believe you, you can miss it because okay. I think there's a hook there. It doesn't have, I mean, it helps if you have an, you know, great sort of uh, personality to, to stand in front of a room but the for people who understand this world and invest you know there are hooks along the line of what someone is saying and then you know you decide whether you spend that time or not I haven't seen so much that you just investors or anybody sort of completely miss on something okay. Martin I assume for you it's part of a passionate idea that you see you have yeah but it's idea. also a match a match between the person and the the, the investor for me, it's I don't I don't even care so much first about the person. I care about the product. So I say, send me something that I can play with, that I can try. Send me something. So I, I get this thing. I'm alone. I, I don't even have the person because it's embarrassing to tell a person you don't like what they do, right? And it's difficult to tell a person you don't like what they do. Having said this, by the way, so many people have told me they didn't like what, what I do. You know. It is so common, and if you are an entrepreneur also, you have to have a very thick skin and be convinced that everyone else, everyone who tells you that, that, that your idea is bad is an idiot, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but having said this, it is, it is uh, a match, okay? So when you think about it, you don't need to captivate every investor of the planet. You don't need to, or think of it as, as getting into a university yeah, it may be a good ego that everyone wants you to accept you in a university, in a great university, but how many universities are you going to attend, okay? So this is kind of similar, like how many, you can tell, take all the investors in the world, you just need enough to fund your run, right? So don't waste your time with people who just are not your match. Be convinced of yourself, of your product, and go on to the next and take 50 rejections and get this thing done. There's a lot of people out there who are actually interested in investing. Cool. All right, so we've got just two more quick areas to discuss, and that's number one, hiring, uh, which is a very important issue. Obviously, you've got to get the hiring right uh, in order to get the idea off the ground, and that comes closely with execution. So, um, Omar, um, was it you that had the idea? For the business? Uh, it was me and my co-founder, yeah. Okay, and then have you hired people? We've hired people, all the people that we've hired, uh, we've known them and worked with them in the past. Okay. So there are 15 people at the company right now. And the, uh, the one thing I don't agree with your presentation was about giving a tiny piece of equity to the people who started the business at the beginning, because these are the people who are gonna take the business forward. And I don't think um, you should be stingy with the equity that you're giving the founding, mem founding team of the company. And giving them that equity has given the, all the people in the company so much passion that wherever they go, they're talking about the product, they're talking about the service, 
And this links back to the investor conversation, where like one of the investors we met, um, it's quite a weird story, where our marketing director, she was on the train, she was approached by a guy who was sitting opposite her, and started talking to her, you know, chatting her up. And all she could talk about was the company, all she talked about was Blipper, this, Blipper, that. And she showed him a demo of it. Uh, then he said, oh, I know a guy who'd be interested in this. And two meetings later, uh, we were in a board meeting with Martin Sorrell. If you guys don't know Martin Sorrell, he's the Bill Gates of the advertising world. He owns uh, WPP. WPP, yeah, that's right, WPP group. And um, you know, that took that relationship much further with the investors. Right. And he's coming So forward. go chat people up on tea tonight. <laughs> yeah. uh, John Moulton, who owns Better Capital, was uh, approached on the way to the loo, and that turned into a deal. So <laughs> what, whatever it takes, right? Yeah. Uh, Rashma on hiring, because you uh, mentioned hiring is an important one, you think? Um, yeah, so early on, I mean, don't, don't stay alone too long, basically. Um, try to get people who, you know, you respect. You, you're not the same, but they bring something to your team and to the product that you can really kind of be a very complementary team to, to, to get an idea going or to get your business to the next level. So, you know, it, it's great to start things with friends. Um, but I mean, to your point, you know, make sure that your business arrangement is clear cut and it doesn't sort of impact your impact your friendship. And don't just bring someone on because they're a friend. Make sure that they're actually contributing something uh, valuable that you you know that's not your core skill set or adding to that adding to that skill set. So, but don't stay alone too long. And uh, if you if you read the beer mat entrepreneur that you mentioned. Um, he, uh, Mike Southern believes that you should basically have five key cornerstones to the business, give them each 20% uh, and then go from there. You've got other people like Felix Dennis, who uh, is the owner of Dennis Publishing, things like The Week magazine, who says, own it all yourself and never give a cent of equity away. Um, so which one is it, or again, does it depend? And if so, what on? Um, Yours wasn't, I mean, you guys used an outsource. That's yeah, why so that's it was it. a small that's amount it. of equity. Yeah, so because you knew they weren't going to stay with you. Yeah, exactly. And that was, you know, and that was, that was kind of, you know, doing a fairly aggressive business deal with, uh, at the time, with friends, and they made money out of it, and we got a great product out of it. That was the kind of the point about um, mm -hmm. being, being careful in your deals. Um, I think it's a horses for courses, right? You know, when you're, especially in early days, you want to get other people in. Great entrepreneurs will, will be surrounded by great people like naturally, because the idea is great, because they have a bit of charisma, because they can articulate it, and they will be able to attract great people, and that's often what is attractive to investors and building great businesses. You surround yourself with great people, like you obviously do with your marketing director. Mm -hmm. Sounds awesome. Um, so yeah, you just, it's, I think it's, it depends. When you, when you start a couple of businesses, you can be a bit more direct, and, and, and perhaps start it without, without cool. giving and, away. And getting a great management team on uh, zero cash, basically give equity away to some extent, that's the two away to some extent, that's the answer. Potentially on. Well, there, I just wanted to add, there's a cultural dimension to that. Like in Spain where I live, people think that if you're trying to give them equity, you're actually ripping them off, you want to pay them little. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. really. Yeah. And that's true yeah. of most continental Europe. So the, the idea of working for equity is a very Anglo-Saxon idea. And it is truly interpreted by many people, ha, ah, he wants to give me these worthless stock options. Because say, what's the value of this? And you say, well, I don't know what the value of this. Could they be worthless? And you have to say, yes, they could be worthless. Okay, but pay me more. You know, so not everybody lives in a, uh, I, this morning I, I had a meeting at, with the UK government in 10 Downing, and I, I was so impressed at the awareness that there is in the UK as to how businesses are essential to society and that the new arms race in the world is to attract the best entrepreneurs to your nation. That awareness is shared by the nations who speak English, is not shared by a lot of other nations in the world. And, there's, and, and that means that in terms of stock options and so on, a lot of people say, look, I want other things. And it's not being stingy, because when I build businesses in America or here in the UK, I gave a greater level of stock options. Then I moved to Spain and I gave a lot of stock options. There was a group of uh, 26 managers that made 70 million euros in a company that I, we built for 38 million euros, we sold for 550 million euros, and most of those guys didn't work. Like, once they make, for many Spanish people, it's like, why am I going to work now that I have all this money? 
some others have a passion, but you have to be careful as to how much more are they going to want to work? Or what is their incentive? And then there's on top of that, their friends hate them, okay? <laughs> Because some societies are very egalitarian, like Spanish society is a very egalitarian society. And when somebody goes way ahead, the other people are envious and uncomfortable and have a hard time dealing with this envy, okay? And so I can see a lot of reasons why being uh, rich is an immigrant job in Spain. And so it is, it is, it is not, these, these issues are very cultural. But having said this, in the Anglo-Saxon world, it is just like I would agree with everyone here, and people understand risk, they understand not, you're not trying to pay them less, which partly you are, but because you hope, you understand the risk, that if things go well, they'll, they'll do like these guys who walked away with a 70 million euros in two years. Okay. It, but it's, it's not always understood, and it's not even understood by everybody in this country. But I think role models, actually on that point, I mean, role models are so, so important, right? I, I think um, in, you know, next year when Facebook goes public, there will be 400 millionaires at least, right? And so everybody there now knows someone <laughs> who they graduated with or, or, or whatnot, or at least you do between Google, Google, um, Facebook, uh, you know, a few of the others. So versus, you know, in, in Estonia, they don't have any problems now with stock options as much because, again, Spotify, uh, sorry, Skype, you know, again, you have a, a pretty big millionaire crowd for a very tiny country. So, I mean, you know, role models are really, really important. And at the UK, I think that's, that's evolved in a really nice way in the last five years because again you you have a lot of role models who say in our business we created you know 30 50 whatever mil millionaires with stock options so. but but having said this in other countries people value a great work environment a, yeah. a, a feeling great at, at sure. work and it's not it's not only about money sure. like mm -hmm. like mo being motivated by money is something that that like it's hard you know when people go to Japan and say, these people, they do everything, they don't want the tip, you give them a tip, they reject it. What's going on? What's wrong with them? Well, there's a sense of duty or, or something that is, is just phenomenal. And, and what I'm saying is, you have to be careful about money incentives across cultures. <coughs> it's, it's true, I suppose, for all hiring that every single person is different. Each yeah. person has different motivations. Salesperson versus developer. Yeah, That's exactly. example, right? Yeah. Our sales yeah. guys actually trade their options yeah. for bigger comps. So they'll say, like, hey, hey, just give me more OT. If I hit my numbers, give yeah. me more cash. Exactly. I want cash down because I, yeah. you know, I want to buy a nice suit or a car, right? Yeah. And, and sort of when it comes Developers to hiring, yeah. <laughs> when it comes to hiring as well, just make sure that you're really sort of focused on what their motivations are. We had a sales guy uh, that was the number one sales guy in Singapore, and every month we kept on clapping him in. It's like congratulations, and then he quit. And we found out he quit because he hated like public praise. Um, yeah, you know, he didn't want that as a motivation. We all thought they loved it. Okay, so um, we're now going to thank you, panel, very, very much indeed. We're now going to open it up to the floor. We have 15 minutes. Martin needs to go off for a conference call. You saw it at the back. Uh, yeah, what do you think of So with Yelp's IPO, is it worth 100 million? Anyone? I can't comment. Yeah, no, who knows? It's a hard one, right? You know, I think all these businesses are a lot to see. We'll know in six months when the stock price is like, yeah. you know, <laughs> or. Hmm. No, I, I mean. <laughs> in my cases, I just don't use the product, so I can't say. Yeah, yeah. With the group one founders, mm. yes. Uh, my question is um, whether you think it's, it matters where a company is set up anymore. Uh, my, my view after having built companies in many different countries is that it matters, but not as much as the people who live in San Francisco think. <laughs> yeah. that, I mean, that said, it, incorporation is different from set up. So, you know, I, 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 st I still think it sucks if you're incorporated in Austria or Germany or because it's just so hard to, all the documentation is in German and it's impossible to understand and it's hard, you know, it's hard to do deals in their, their laws or they have laws around options and how you, how you cannot grant them and so 
So in that in incorporation, UK, US, investors broadly understand and don't care, either, either one. And then in terms of starting up, um, I actually think if you can leverage sort of again your cost base somewhere cheaper, yet maintain a good you know work, work culture, that's a great way to do it. Your commercial front end will have to like travel between you know between sort of probably New York, London, San Francisco. No, China. yeah, I, I agree with that. When we started Fun, we were a Spanish company, and we are a kind of a, a Spanish company, but we're a UK company legally. Because Sequoia, we were the first European investment of Sequoia, the first one they ever did, and the first investment that Google ever did in Europe. And they said, look, if the pay documents don't come in English, don't bother. Yeah. No hablo español. Yeah. <laughs> and, <that's, laughs> and that's an important point, right? If you, um, I think London's a great place to start a business right now because yeah. you get to leverage the cost base of, of a lot of other European countries. There are some amazing developers out of, I was in Romania last week, it's yeah. insane. Like, some, some amazing guys. Um, but they're all coming to like round Old Street. You hear more languages spoken every day than you do in you know most European countries. But that said, what's the common story here? Raising money. Raising money is easier in the U.S. Yeah. It is insanely yeah. easier in the U.S. The funds are bigger. You can you know if for any entrepreneur there is there is more money at the moment um, that knows where to put it. So it, there are reasons to have it face you know facing off in different places. But you can do that from Europe. You can do that from lots of places. You don't have to be in the valley. But if you're going to raise money. I'm sorry to say, and I, you know, certain values, yeah, I would yeah, say, yeah. getting to the US. You know. Absolutely. So for raising finance, is it worth going to the US? Yeah. Specifically? Yes, to yes. Okay. It's just so much easier. Yeah, it's just so much but, easier. But to, they're not just going to give you, uh, you know, five million and no. say, oh, bye. Yeah. <laughs> no, they, they expect you to be around and your, right. your yeah. commercial sort of yeah. operations need to be around. So. You can't go with your business plan, you United yeah. Airlines flight out of your Yeah, business. exactly. So. Yeah, that's another question to you. So what, what's your experience? Uh, starting business with friends, and what do you uh, believe about this? Well, um, the business time with friends, I've started businesses with family members before, with brother, but I'm a home and I've only been graduated for two years, so all the businesses that I've started have been during university and during school time. Um, with friends, uh, it's okay because the friends that I know are quite well skilled and they have the expertise to do what they're doing. If to be able to grow the company so fast, you know, we can't afford to have people who don't know what they're doing. And Andy, my co-founder, was a friend of a friend. He wasn't like my best friend, so he didn't have all the baggage of best friends get. But he was definitely a friend. He was a, he was, um, and um, uh, I think the big thing is separation of duties, like being clear on what you do so that you don't have overlap. It's when, it's, um, you know, it's when he was product, I was commercial, right? So I'm CEO and he, he has the product, how he lives in San Francisco now. Um, maybe that says something, <laughs> um, but um, but I think if, as long as you've got cl really clear um, purposes and, and we get on great stuff, so it's possible. No, I, I think with the, the starting business with friends can be a, an abysmal failure and you can lose your friendship and your business also, uh, but it, when it works well, it is incredible to enjoy that with a friend. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's kind of like a binary situation. And yeah. there's a friend I made at Columbia, when I studied at Columbia University, who still is uh, like the godfather of one of my children. My, I, he, became, he became my partner in two businesses that I started that we took uh, to a great valuation and we did very well. And then he, so I was kind of his boss, right, of my friend. That was kind of difficult, but then, and then he became the head of my uh, my family office and then like when when he was like 47 he said well now it's my turn I'm going to start a business and you're going to work for me right <laughs> and it, it was interesting because because we're such good friends and the business became very it's it's a company called the Olia which this year will do like 120 million euros in Ibiza and it's been started only five years ago and it's a wind farm operator and he's a nuclear engineer alternative energy engineer like he had always wanted to do this and I said okay fine this time you're the CEO and I'll I'll accompany you and so we've had this amazing friendship through three companies that got to be worth over half a billion and we had rough times and we we had very difficult times at some point but we always overcame the difficulties I, I had lunch with him this week I see him all the time so when it works it's phenomenal 
When it doesn't work, you lose a friend and a business. But you need someone who's the boss. And yeah. I think that's the important yeah. point. So yeah. I, am, I am now Andy's boss in a similar way, and he'll admit that. Like, yeah. it's fine. And that was a difficult transition for us. It was really freaking hard last or two years ago when it happened. But, but, but when you work it out, it's great. And it works great still. And I'll definitely work for him at some point. No. Same with you. I hope, it, I hope we're as successful as <laughs> him. So. I think the same uh, for me. When uh, we started off this company, uh, we decided who's going to become the CEO, who's going to become CTO, and we decided that my partner was best to become the CEO because he had, he was first of all older than me, so when he walks into these massive meetings, <laughs> he gets taken a lot more seriously. And uh, he's also a good presenter, a good speaker, so the, we, but we own equal shares in the company. So someone being the boss, uh, I don't see it as a good thing. As long as you pick the right person. Yeah, it's good. Um, you have said that basically when you are, or if you want to, to look for funding in some country, they expect you for, to be around that country, which is, I mean, which makes sense. Um, I am actually a co-founder and CEO of a Spanish uh, company, which is based in Madrid. So I'm, of course, uh, trying to look for seed funding there, okay? Uh, so, by the way, I'll try to send you the software <laughs> you go, because so you are going to love it. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my question is, um, should I try to look for seed funding also here in, in the UK, especially in London that uh, has this uh, nice environment now for entrepreneurship? What do you think about mixing yeah. uh, yes. funding yes. from Yes, yes. Too. Yes. Yeah, right. Europe, Europe is, is uh, fantastic in that sense, even though it's kind of falling apart. <laughs> but um, it's, it's not falling apart. Spanish. It's not falling <laughs> apart for us. Uh, for us in technology, we live in a wonderful world. Um, no, what I, what I wanted to say is that Europe is small enough that people will say, OK, I'll get on a flight to Madrid. I'll get on a flight to Prague. I'll get on a flight. It's not, it's not a problem uh, if you were like some friends of mine who are doing startups in gaming in Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. then people say, hmm, investing in Buenos Aires, whatever, and, and they, it's a little harder, but they've done, it's interesting Buenos Aires because they, it's also a very difficult environment, uh, economic, but it's been, there's companies that came out of Buenos Aires that are worth $3 billion on NASDAQ, and like Mercado Libre, and so, it got such a reputation now that people say, well, maybe I'll get on a 12 hour flight, or Brazil, now a lot of people are flying to Brazil to make investments. So investors are trying to go where, where the most original and, and, and executable ideas are. And certainly inside of Europe, it's worthwhile coming to London. Good question, thank you. There's been a lot of talk about software. Are there actually friends with young IT startups? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that global? In America, it's much worse. Uh, it's much worse in America. But they, well, I, I should say, I mean, I patented the idea of phone, and I and I have I'm a happy <coughs> patent holder. But the last time I had an idea where I built a company that was very valuable because I used to be ideologically against patents. So I didn't patent my idea, and then someone else patented, and I had to spend two years defending myself for this patent troll who patented my idea. And I finally proved in court that it was my idea and I won. But so patents are an inconvenience. They shouldn't exist in my view except for medicine and maybe some other things, but they certainly shouldn't exist for software. But they exist and they are a problem and especially in the US. Yeah, we've got, we've got loads going on at the moment. Like one is for the ability to upgrade within a software product. Like, you know, how many software products have that in there? You know, and it's just, it's just middle business. It's just inconvenient. As you say, even if it doesn't get the extremes you had, they're just, they're just a pain. You've just got to spend some time talking to them when they're in relevance. So, yeah. And it's a way of big companies protect, there's patent trolls, but there's also big companies that have the ability to patent a lot of things over little companies mm -hmm. that just got started. And it's also a way for the big guy. If you think about in America, for example, uh, uh, the, some of the things that are wrong with America have to do with lobbying, right? The fact that the democratic process is very, very much geared by lobbies. And you say, well, who are lobbies? Well, lobbies generally represent decadent industries that are big, 
that are trying to protect themselves against smaller and upcoming industries that are small and that they don't have any lobbying power. So patents are lobbying are two ways by which established players protect themselves from upcoming players. There is, I would add one thing, which is not around patents, but it's around trademarks and uses of that. So for us, when we started um, our business, the name Huddle is an incredibly important part. It's one of the biggest bits of our IP because if you tell someone, especially in America, that you're getting in a huddle, they kind of know immediately what it is, right? And it sticks in the memory and it grows, you know, et cetera. So for us, the name was incredibly important. So we spent a lot of time and money early on protecting that name. And now that has been incredibly useful for us because it's enabled us to win against the likes of Google and Microsoft who have tried to, you know, use it all the time. It's the third time Google have tried to use that name. Right? And every time we're like, fuck off, get out of here, you know? So, um, but, so it took time and money, but now it's incredibly useful. Now it's an incredibly important part of it. So I think you can use them to your advantage as well as a small business. So you got trademarks, right? Yeah. In the, yeah. All over the place. Yes. Hi. Um, if you have a social business and uh, you have a great cause, when you when you say you are cause, a lot of people want to jo join. Should, should you try to bring as many people on board, e even if they they won't work uh, that hard or equally with the others? Or should you try to uh, remain a small team so that you can? Uh, Uh, is it a political party? <laughs> mm. No, because I, I once was talking to a very famous politician, I'm not going to say his name, and I, I had an idea for a political party, and he said to me, you don't understand, at least you choose your employees. I cannot choose my voters. <laughs> okay. It sounds like you're halfway between a political party and a company. We've got time for just one more, maybe two more questions. Okay, lady here. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> um, I have a question because I'm from an anthropology background and I'm studying public management here, so I have no IT background, but I do have an idea and it's about communicate, bringing, improving the communication and so that any in new ways of communicating, I think, will blossom because you've got so obsessed about it. How important is it for me to find a partner to If you think it's if you think it's a software product, it might I don't know what the idea is, but if you think it has to be enabled by software, then you need to kind of turn your idea into some form of reality. So even if that's you sketching it out and someone making the next step happen, and then from there you can take it to someone who could build it, you've got to kind of turn what's in your head into into something, right? And for, for us, it was Andy was able to take my idea and turn it into a prototype, and then we were able to take that prototype to someone who could build the back end, and that's how we got it going, does that make sense? So I had the problem, a bit like, I guess you had the idea, and then Andy was able to come up with a way to make that look good, and then we took someone to build it. You've got to start somewhere and, and start showing it to some people you know who might be able to help you. Help you uh... One more. Yep. Uh, you to go. You to go. Oh. OK. Uh, I would ask uh, Martin then. What should we say thank you to Martin? Yeah. What should we say? Could, what should we say thank you to? Could, yeah. Okay. Just I have a conference call at 6:30. Yeah. I really have to go. We'll On behalf of all of us here, thank you, Martin, thank you. very much. <laughs>
um, you need a very supportive network because you call them up all the time and you need the help, right? That's why you really got to want to do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so thank you all for being here with us today. Thank you for the brands up here. Thank you most importantly for our panel. And uh, thank you for your time. Good luck, guys.